Okay, good morning and good afternoon. Thank you for joining Carter School for the set of events today <clears throat> devoted to one year since the beginning of Ukrainian invasion in, uh, uh, by Russia. This next section will be led by our postdo postdoctoral scholar, Margarita Tevasan. Uh, Margarita, it's yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us uh, this morning and afternoon for some of you. Um, this is a really um, important uh, platform for us to discuss um, not only uh, the year of devastation, loss of human life, and uh, and uh, struggling for Ukrainian people, but also think ahead uh, what can be done and what capacity do academic institutions have to play when it comes to a uh, post-war reconstruction and building building resilience and stability and security for their countries. For that matter, uh, I am very pleased to share that uh, Carter School, together with Tempere, uh, Peace Research Institute uh, have launched a partnership to collaborate on uh, on design and implementation of a joint program that would aim to mobilize higher education institutions in Ukraine and beyond to plan for the reconstruction of the study uh, of the of the country. We are at the very uh, early stages of this uh, project implementation, and I'm happy that today we have a great panel uh, uh, of our partners uh, where, we, where we will be discussing uh, what uh, project aims at, what we're trying to accomplish, what capacities do we have, and how we envision uh, this uh, uh, this partnership to develop and what we envision it to bring uh, to Ukrainian people and higher education. So joining me today are our colleagues from Tampere University, Marco uh, Lehti, uh, also Vadim uh, Ramashov and Anita Kyusilehto, uh, who, uh, and together with uh, Karina Korostelina, we will be discussing the project. Um, so I would uh, uh, like to, um, if, um, I mean, the order, the order would be, we will go first with Anita and Vadim, who are doing um, uh, research also in general on uh, the role of higher education in post-war uh, settings. Uh, but uh, before that, I would like to uh, give our uh, Dean, uh, Dr. Alpaslan Ozerdem, uh, uh, a couple minutes to present this initiative because it was the master, his mastermind with, with Marco. So uh, with, without further ado, Dean, please. Um, thank you very much, Margarita. Uh, you know, um, being called a mastermind, I don't know, uh, there is the kind of a slightly sinister aspect of that, right? Uh, the, but this is very much a collective work and action and idea uh, that we have been developing with Tapri, as you point out, and it's fantastic that our colleagues are joining us in this panel. So really the main premise of this initiative is, well, one day the war will come to an end in Ukraine, right? All wars come to an end at one day. And I hope that's gonna be sometimes very soon. And I hope it's going to be something that um, will lead to a process of um, um, a comprehensive reconstruction uh, of the country. And one of the main challenges we have faced in other environments is that uh, whenever a war, a war comes to an end, we seem to be caught unprepared for that. And, and the reconstruction process becomes rather challenging. And in fact, in the reconstruction process, uh, we tend to make more harm than good in some instances. The whole appropriation of funding and its spending and, uh, you know, kind of like the multi-level uh, uh, issues with reconstruction from physical reconstruction to, to the reconstruction of services, infrastructure, and, um, and overall the reconstruction of economy and, uh, and life in general. That's going to be an, uh, an uh, Herculean task. And just to avoid um, uh, the kind of uh, potential problems with it, uh, we thought that it would be really great Capri and the Carter School could facilitate a process in which a wide range of Ukrainian partners from academia 
to national, local, regional uh, authorities, civil society could come together and start envisaging how that post-conflict, post-war reconstruction would look like. We are aware of uh, the fact that there are many similar initiatives being undertaken and put together by different partners. And, and because of that, we are putting our emphasis as an entry point with the um, Ukrainian higher education uh, system. So our idea is that um, by engaging, by working with the Ukrainian universities, we can, uh, we can initiate the process of preparation for reconstruction. Because as I mentioned, that will be sort of so many issues to consider and, and, and factor in. And, and, and also one of the things that I think in that process is, it's going to be rather political um, uh, situation. So uh, war comes to an end, but the politics of war continues in post-war reconstruction period. And with that in mind, I think conflict resolution will need to be an integral part of our thinking. Resolving disputes, putting right leverage at the right places in order to bring parties together and, and for the Ukrainians to recover from the impact of the war in, a, in an effective way. I think this initiative could play a significant role. So as you mentioned, this is an, um, an idea we are approaching to a number of um, international and Ukrainian um, uh, partners, uh, uh, potential partners. And, uh, and with that, um, I would now, uh, I would like to hand over to the panel uh, to discuss, uh, you know, what this whole initiative is about and, and how far we progress and what we would like to do next. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dean. Uh, thank you for this introduction. And now I would like to uh, invite Anita and Vadim uh, to uh, present us with uh, uh, your research that you are doing and kind of set the stage for us to understand what is the role of higher education institutions in addressing some of the post-conflict, post-violence uh, uh, issues uh, in, uh, in the societies. Okay, thank you very much, Margarita, and, uh, and thank you all for uh, for the opportunity to be part of this uh, this seminar today. So um, uh, so what uh, my my colleague Vadim and uh, and myself what we've been doing uh, uh, well we can practically say over the past year now because the reflection started uh, as soon as uh, the we woke up to the shock of, of the beginning of this war um, and. Um, what we've been developing is this um, initiative uh, called Addressing War Anxieties in and by University Communities. Um, and, um, okay, I have to put the, uh, okay, perfect. Um, so to, uh, to, to present the initial goals of the initiative, so what, what we were interested in uh, was to identify the wide ranging effects of war uh, on university communities um, to analyze the reactions of their differently situated members to these effects. And by differently situated, we, we thought of uh, different roles of the faculty, of, um, of administrative staff, of, uh, of student, students at different levels and, and so on, but also uh, of diverse nationalities within university communities. Um, well, to evaluate measures undertaken by different universities, and this um, uh, being said, uh, I, I'm personally part of the, the scholars at risk uh, group in my university, which has existed much before the war started, of course, but then nation nationwide or <clears throat> nationally in Finland, uh, many activities were geared or, or uh, towards supporting um, Ukrainian academics and students who uh, who were uh, leaving the country because of the war. Uh, <clears throat> well, then to uh, map out the best practices and approaches to deal with war-related anxieties in universities, so learn of initiatives that were already uh, implemented in other universities in Finland, for example, but not only, 
limited to, uh, to Finland. Um, and most importantly for this panel to generate ideas of how university communities can support those directly and indirectly affected by war. And of course, at the same time, ensure the core university value of equal treatment of all its members. Um, and what we've done until now are <clears throat> have, have been two sets of workshops that have been organized. Uh, uh, one in early November uh, uh, 2022, so last November, as part of the, the rectors uh, uh, unions sustainability seminar. So university rectors and universities of applied sciences. So bringing up uh, together um, basically the whole uh, higher education uh, community in at the upper level, but then also through different participants uh, together. And, and then a week ago in, um, in Helsinki uh, with another set, set of uh, workshops as part of development days and um, and, um, and we've maintained communication in between these, these events uh, with participants and other interested persons. We've had some 40 people attending in, in person or remotely. And, and then also uh, we have a broader community of inter people interested in this initiative and, uh, and, and bringing their insights into these discussions also. And, and what we've done in between as well has been to more formally include organizations of the Finnish peace movement in these discussions. So uh, two of the big, uh, biggest uh, organizations were present last Friday and, uh, and this drawing on also uh, on our earlier forms of cooperation between the academia and the, and the peace movement. Um, and now what we'd like to do is to, to present a set of uh, uh, recommendations to, that, uh, that have been generated to be taken forward. And, and while uh, we have a, a, a long list of recommendations addressing different levels, um, levels of action, the, the ones that, uh, that we'd like to present now are, are the most uh, geared towards, uh, towards the, uh, the aims of this, this seminar especially. Um, and firstly, um, well, non-residential scholarships for people in Ukraine. And this taking into account that the war is still uh, ongoing and this is something that's, uh, that uh, could and, and should be uh, done and thought of uh, already. There are a few international programs that, uh, that provide such funding opportunities, so which are not residence based uh, in the country providing the, the funding, but, um, um, but what would be important is the, to, to really uh, offer these possibilities, which would also preserve, preserve the intellectual capacity of Ukraine for its post-war reconstruction so that academics can stay in the country. Um, and developing such scholarship schemes, I mean, if we think of beyond this, uh, this war also could help alleviating brain drain in other conflict contexts too. So in that way, it can be something that, that can bring added value much beyond this particular context. Um, well, secondly, currently many universities in Ukraine are organizing their courses online. And, and this, of course, requires proper equipment um, that can also be donated by universities. So there is this need for material support. Um, and additionally, since the energy infrastructure in, in Ukraine is now being significantly damaged, the universities in Ukraine need, they need their autonomous power supply systems. And, and for this, uh, universities in Finland and much beyond could purchase and donate generators. So again, like something very concrete, to support the activities that are undertaken right now. Um, well then, uh, uh, despite the fact that all of us want this war to end uh, as soon as possible immediately, um, we need to also recognize that not all students and university personnel from Ukraine will be able to return to their home institutions in the foreseeable future and especially those people who come from the occupied territories or from the territories with heavily destroyed infrastructure. So uh, in universities uh, outside Ukraine need to also think of this 
special long-term programs and how this can help in the recon eventual reconstruction process of Ukraine. Well, fourthly, um, international students uh, who study at universities in Ukraine do not receive enough, enough support due to the condition that formal support is often available primarily uh, for the citizens of Ukraine, uh, while many of the international students are not able to return to their countries of origin for various reasons, um, and including on ongoing armed conflicts in their countries of origin. Um, and these students often cannot get the same temporary protection status as citizens of Ukraine, so we need to remember academic solidarity also with these, uh, these students. Um, and fifth, uh, while schools and universities, uh, so higher education sphere is actively involved in providing stu study opportunities for people from Ukraine, there is a considerable lack of opportunities at the vocational education level. So there is also a need to develop uh, special programs to ad address these issues, these educational needs as well, and, and how can higher education community uh, uh, support these types of initiatives as well. Um, and I would now ask if Vadim wants to step in. I, we, we shared the task a little bit because I'm unfortunately have to leave a bit early, but okay. Thank you, Anita, yes, thank you. Uh, uh... Yeah, just maybe I would add uh, something based on because we still had not really a good chance to reflect on our last uh, workshop that took place just a week ago in Helsinki. Um, so these are recommendations that mostly emerged during our discussion in late November uh, and uh, in following our latest workshop, we came to the conclusion that uh, probably we would need to focus on two main directions of our work, like what we can do at the moment. It's the first one is planning, organize a planning groups for rebuilding universities in universities, the university communities in Ukraine. That would include, of course, people from Ukraine, uh, those who are based in Ukraine and also who are ab uh, abroad at the moment, but also the communities here, university communities here in, in, in Finland, including also administrative personnel and, and policy makers and civil society organizations. So, and what one of this um, initiative is important that of course we, we will somehow rely on using uh, online tools, first of all, but what is also an idea that came as part of this initiative of the planning group is to organize a certain platform that would keep together the scattered members of the university communities of Ukraine that are now, now nowadays like the, the same, uh, the colleagues and the uh, studentship of the same universities now are scattered throughout the world. I don't, ha I don't have that maybe um, very sustainable platform on which they can preserve their university community. So somehow to recreate this online uh, university communities, this what could be one of the tasks of this planning group. And also of course the main uh, task of this planning group is to think about the future when the war will end and how to reconstruct the university communities already in more material sense already in the country. And the second uh, uh, direction of our work is uh, exactly facilitating the everyday work of universities in Ukraine. So thinking about their material support and also some um, online tools that we as university community here in Finland can somehow facilitate and, and, and help. Uh, but of course, because, uh, for example, those issues like uh, autonomous power supply system generators, this was especially acute uh, in uh, in autumn and uh, approaching winter. Now maybe it's getting less acute, the situation, uh, but of course there are many other needs, material needs of the university communities that must be addressed. So what is important is this, uh, the mapping of these needs is continuous, uh, careful, uh, and uh, based on this mapping, we would uh, somehow create the uh, uh, additional plan how to facilitate the everyday work of universities in Ukraine. So, yeah, this would be probably my few Thank points. you. Thank you, Vadim. Thank you, Anita. I think you're uh, raising a very good uh, 
point, uh, especially when it comes to preserving and developing the intellectual capacity in, in Ukraine, because um, as we know, uh, once people are caught up in the survival mode, uh, the, the, the first things that kind of drop off the, the plate are the education and then you will, you can end up with a generation of like lost capacity just because there is no time and physical capacity to deal with education when people are struggling with basic survival. So keeping this at, at the forefront of the agenda and talking about it and presenting the impact of it and what can be done is really very uh, important. Sorry, I, my toddler, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so now uh, I would like to, uh, I would like to uh, give the floor to, uh, to Marco who uh, will present, I think, uh, what we were thinking, uh, kind of a, a larger thinking about how this project and how this uh, collaboration and emphasis on education fits in general into a larger scheme of things uh, of, uh, creating stability and sustainability also in Europe and how it can be one of the pillars to having a more uh, a kind of uh, more, more stability in Europe by the virtue of Ukraine being one of the largest uh, countries on the European continent and how this war is actually shaping the, the rest of European uh, policies. So Marco, please. Yeah, thank you very much. You promised quite a lot what I what I plan to do. I'm feeling really humble after listening to the first first kind of keynote presentation and also after listening Anita sometimes very concrete suggestions and um, but especially I think that my, my first thinking after uh, after listening at the, the long presentation at the beginning that what I as an outsider can bring in into the, this picture that the, what, what is kind of added value that I us as a kind of a, a kind of a Finnish scholars or US scholars can contribute, and, and I think that has been also starting point of my thinking. Uh, uh, so it, it's it's obvious in one hand that that that's this kind of a uh, project which is supporting and and and, and empowering uh, Ukrainian higher education capacity. Uh, to reconstruct or, or to, to contribute to peace building is certainly a needy. And, and, and that, that it, it's quite significant elements of, of our building a, a kind of resilience and, 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 and whole Ukrainian civil society, which is, has appeared to be very, very strong, but, but I think that they are still needed of any different kind of a support for, for, for capacity and capability to, to cope with these, the stress. And, and, and I think, as, as was said, I think in the beginning of this panel that all wars come to end in, in, in one, one day. And, and, and I agree and hopefully it comes sooner than later. I'm, I'm a bit more pessimistic on, on that case than, than the, the others are. They may be lasted very, very long. But it's also important to think about that when the war in, 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 the, in the fight kind of come to ends in, in, in the forms of fightings, it continues in the mind of people. And 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 that we need to think think about. I think that is the main call of all this kind of a rebuilding, to create a trust on peaceful future that the people trust that they they these will be kind of a, uh, uh, you can build about your own life or life for your children in, in the future. That has been ruined. Drastic terms in Ukraine. It has ruined in in, in whole Europe in, in many many way. That because we in in many part of Europe we believe that the kind of interstate war belonged to only to the past. And at least it's somewhere in, 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 in global south or another part of the world, not in, in, in Europe. And, and I think that from the Finnish perspective, uh, 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 this the experience has been very strong. And, and I think the kind of even the vicarious kind of experiences that we could be one in, in, instead of that. Same way like in, 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 in for example, in our, neighboring Estonia, which actually celebrating its independence day today. And I would like to have a celebrate this 24th only as Estonia independence day, not as anniversary of Ukraine, this kind of war in Ukraine, but this is how it is. Uh, uh, so, so I think I'll think about how we can contribute on this, on, on this kind of a support of higher education, not building in, in, in also not given a material support or not, not given this kind of a, uh, uh, tools, 
but starting on building a, a, a processes which recover the trust on peaceful, peaceful kind of uh, the trust on peaceful change and, and trust on peaceful future, which has been it's been so much and destroyed. And saying these, I think that that's how we can end it. It, it is a big, it, it's only can happens in, in that way that that's we trust on, on Ukrainian own capacity and capability and their own knowledge. They have a really rich kind of higher education systems. They have knowledge and 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 only way we can enter there is is to in somehow facilitate support and network connected to people in 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 a way but it, it's it's they who decide and, and that we are only there for a bit on, on, on helping these. When I'm thinking, and I think that if I've been thinking in in, in last weeks or days on, on, on these couple more general themes and on, 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 on phenomenon, which I think that perhaps this kind of uh, uh, initiatives can, can contribute or create it or some kind of a, a larger larger discussion and I think that the first is is, is the discussion about the uh, generally about the the model of peace building because we all are peace researchers and we're feeling like an expert of peace building and they are large community of peace builders but very broad communities in in, in Europe and in the US uh, 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 but I think that we needed to in very drastic term to think about what is a peace building in a, in, in this context it started already in, in the beginning of this, this seminar and, and on, on that the referring that how uh, international uh, uh, conflict mitigation and conflict resolution structures failed to solve this, how there was no the existing mediation uh, 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 kind of a practices didn't manage to contribute. And I think the major issue is that, that the, even we have a, a lot of develop on these kind of a tools during the past two or three decades, they have been targeted very different kind of a conflicts. They are targeted mostly on asymmetric conflicts, kind of civil, uh, uh, kind of war kind of a conflicts in the global south, uh, uh, not on, on, on interstate wars and not a kind of a wars where there, there, there is a, a big power, great power using aggressive power against the others. And where there, there is a certain a strong kind of a normative I, basis or that, that the using of violence or war is somehow justified tool of wild a kind of, of, of politics. And I think in that sense, saying that, that also that not only a peace diplomats needed to be think a new way, it's also so that we have to think about also what peace building is in, in a new way in, in after this kind of a war. Of course, we have a lot of learnings concerning, we've learned about the importance of the uh, uh, trauma healings and in, in Orin today and all these kind of things are common, but it, it's also important that we just not bringing the learnings from the already existing conflicts on, 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 on Ukraine situation, but starting to think about in very uh, uh, a new way. And I think we, we can return back on, on older days also, perhaps on, on, on experiences uh, of the Second World War and, and recovering that. And one thing which actually is very concrete when listening and Anita's and, and, and Vadim's presentation about the uh, problems of, of, of the carrying all higher education students back in, 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 into their studies. One thing which is, is that in my mind when being kind of a reading on different different kind of articles in recent, recent days is that the, there's a lot of uh, war, young World War veterans who's have to return back in the university studies. And they have so many of our university students who have lost their life during the war. But they also, how you return uh, and on, on your studies, have the experiences as a soldier in, in the front in, in years. So that is something which Finland have faced this problem. I think that also in after the Second World War, which, which came to mind, small things, but really important in, 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 in my, my opinion on this. Uh, uh, so, we needed to create a discussion about what what is the what is a peace building in this kind of a context. Needed the kind of I think that is adaptive peace building. Adaptive peace building is something which we needed, uh, uh, and 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 not not just a copy from all, all thing, things and trust on the capacity of Ukrainian Ukrainian strong civil society, and then starting the discussion what what kind of a 
support is needed and what 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 is what is important certainly all kind of the support is, is needed but that's not just a copy what is already existing and other things what i want to be thinking and, and 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 i think that we can support hopefully is to linking that to say the, this kind of a uh, development of, uh, of the peace building imagining and visioning a peace in ukraine support of ukraine higher education not only targeted only to ukraine but in whole europe and and for, for me it's been from the very beginning this has been not just a war in ukraine it, it's war against the whole europe uh, a war in europe unfortunately the, the all the fightings the all deaths are there in, in ukraine but it's concerning the whole europe and it, it's all the the uh, uh, existing security structures also structures that were planned uh, um, to preserve the peace the conflict mitigation structures that were in europe have been destroyed they are collapsed they are not anymore existing we have to create them <coughs> anew uh, uh, um, and even even the, this is in many level is certainly is this, it's an imperial war of russia uh, against ukraine to destroy the ukrainian kind of existence but it's same way on a war to really redefine and contesting the kind of existing order and that's why i, I think it, it's 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 important that we are not only the, that we are contributing to something in ukraine we have to also ask how ukraine and ukrainians is contributing to european peace how they're contributing to building are imagining the whole uh, European peace and its structures. So engaging Ukrainians to talk about the, uh, about the, the whole Europe and not we are going there on, on talking about uh, how how the peace or security is is is, is built in in Ukraine. And I think this is connected uh, uh, or, or where we're needing different kind of decolonizing approaches and on on. Uh, the signal we needed, uh, and that's been mentioned already in, in decolonizing uh, the Russian uh, uh, politics and Russian uh, approaches to Ukraine, and, and, and this, is, this is certainly the, the major element of, of building perhaps long-term reconciliation in, in, in the area. But I think it, it's, on the other hand, we needed also kind of a, some kind of decolonizing policies and approaches against uh, Western perspectives and uh, for the re Western research uh, uh, about Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, I think there's two points and quickly made it and then and I've been in last week I've, I've brought in one one column and, and, and think about on this issue and, and notice that there was interesting discussion going on in Northern America about the a need to decolonize or uh, the Northern American Russian Eastern European studies. So the noticing how much has been kind of dominated for certain Russian imperial perspectives and how this has been influenced on that, that the certain kind of interpretation they emphasized uh, and how the money is divided and also how it's been named, how it's been one country's been can rise above others and others are putting on, 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 on kind of a, uh, calling only as, as a collective name of Eastern European or Eurasia and so on. Uh, uh, same way in, in international relations studies, uh, there's strong need to be decolonized the kind of approaches. So, uh, especially the looking about the, uh, the IR realistic, it is obvious that in, in their discussion, the, the, the sovereignty of Ukraine and, and, and other East Europeans is somehow lesser less than, than the, the big powers, and, 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 and they are more ready of. of uh, of, of understanding kind of uh, interest, the security interests of, of Russia and other big powers. And I think that we needed to change the way of thinking that, that that's, uh, uh, if we want to have a recreated a peaceful Europe of, of seeing, uh, seeing accept kind of uh, respecting that all sovereignty is equal and, and all perspective. And this is much already on also on based on, on much ancient like a division in, in Europe, which go back on, 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 on the days of enlightenment, when the, the Eastern Europe was kind of invented uh, as an uh, opposite for the, for the Western Europeans. It was uh, the mirror through which the Western Europeans built up their 
image of their own superiority and, and use that. And, 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 and Larry, Larry Fulf have written a, a excellent books about that. And that's been kind of a dominated of Western European perspectives towards the kind of Eastern Europe in general and Ukraine in, in part, kind of or, also. So that is not really listening to their experiences, seeing that, that they are somehow more packed forward and that they know the things are better. And we have seen several times during the, during the kind of a war of, of, of this taking place that the kind of experiences of those people in, 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 in the East are seen somewhere less important. I think that I, I'm, I return and ended about the two kind of references from, the, from, the, uh, uh, from Estonia. First, if you follow the Munich Security Conference a week ago, uh, uh, I think the, the Estonian Prime Minister Kai, Kaya Kalas make it quite interesting kind of a, uh, uh, how to say, Notice was against the, the, the chairman and, uh, and, and French leaders pointing out that yes, that you didn't listen to us in a year ago because we were much more, we were knowing more or less what's coming up, and you don't know at the more, you are not anymore listening to us. So you're doing the same thing again, that not listening to experiences of people on, on, on the area. And then another Estonian, this is Estonian Independence Day anyway. Uh, uh, and I ended that 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 where we can could come on an, an issue is, is a Estonian IR scholars Maria Melkser wrote already uh, uh, in last uh, or, well half a year ago an article we cause that putting out this kind of a need for decolonizing but also kind of argue that the war could be also a point on a kind of a new uh, uh, post-colonial moment where we make these kind of a different kind of a relationship visible. And it's a created an, an, a new kind of a, a mindscape, new kind of perspectives. And I think that that's we hopefully can contribute in one way or another, or, or, or this kind of ways, uh, how we are reimagining, envisioning the, the kind of a European peace in, in general and, 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 and Ukrainian position in, in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you for this uh, presentation. And I want to kind of pick up on two things that you have mentioned. Well, I, get, I think three things that you have mentioned. One, I really appreciate your you stating that once the fighting over, that does not necessarily mean that it stops in the minds of people and how we can, our education can be mobilized to uh, also win or end the, the war in the minds of people to prepare for more peaceful or more functional coexistence uh, moving forward and uh, your mention of uh, how we will have um, a generation of young soldiers returning to academic institutions with the experience of the de devastating war with the trauma with the memories and how that can be incorporated constructively into the learning and education process that can benefit the society as a whole but i think another thing that i want to pick up from what you have said uh, placing this in the overall context of uh, European security and how we as a international community as a world move forward is the is the idea that some the whole is mo much bigger than its singular parts and how we can focus on reconstruction of Ukraine not to be a separate part in itself but how can it holistically support a general more uh, um, like more peaceful Europe more peaceful world in, in this matter and this kind of very uh, well segues into uh, Karina's presentation because uh, fortunately we're not in, in this case at Carter School especially we're not starting uh, from the scratch like uh, Karina has been working uh, in Ukraine for many years now and I would now it would like to invite her to speak about the experiences and the projects and engagement that already have taken place as early, even before the 2014 uh, uh, crisis in Crimea uh, started. So uh, please, Karina, that's uh, now we would like to hear from you. Thank you. I would like to share screen. Um, this is uh, speaking, first of all, I would, I would like to start first with the systemic approach, and then I will give specific examples of what we've done and how we can build on this. So this particular model, which I, sh you show, I show right now, it's a model results on my research on resilience to war in Ukraine in 2014, when the Crimea was occupied 
and the uh, military action started in Donetsk area. So this particular approach was uh, what I called for a loop uh, a model of resilience can be something which we can use, develop further in our particular work. And the idea of this particular for loop is that resilience itself, ability of uh, Ukraine to be ready and effectively uh, address all issues related to war and post-war reconstruction, strongly connected with four major uh, processes. Dynamics of conflict itself, how this processes of reconstruction will address dynamics of the conflict, but also are changed through this dynamic. Second is important external resources. What external resources are available, but also how Ukrainians, and Marco told about it, how Ukrainians shape ability, viability, and uh, structures of external resources. Also, what societal capacities are available, but how through this process of resilience and a reconstruction, we can change societal capacities. And finally, what are dynamics of identity and power, how society function, and how it can change through this uh, process of post-war reconstruction. And more specifically, I want to say about external resources at this point, because we're discussing collaboration. And a lot of in this research, which again, I conducted in the beginning of the war 2014, military uh, operation 2014, uh, a lot of um, complaints which came from Ukrainians that international organizations come with their own conceptual idea of what's going on without really understanding, adjusting, talking to or taking local perspective. And what is important with local, and this is what stressed multiple times in our school, I know Margarita working on it, what is important is that local perspective doesn't mean local perspective on local. <laughs> local perspective means also local perspective on micro, meso, and macro level. Uh, how, um, for example, coordination between international actors function, what peacekeeping means. Uh, how we define, like, because, for example, with the Minsk agreement, there were so many problems, I will not go deeper into it, but definition, which were no agreement, what actually conflict we are dealing with, and who are parties involved in the conflict. And this was the major issue, because there were no common agreement between all international actors, who is involved in conflict, and where conflict actually originate from and what's going on and how you define economic aid to Ukraine and economic sanctions and our dean today started very important um, note in the morning that yes more economic sanctions are needed more political sanctions are needed and why they were not implemented a year ago or in 2014 even earlier so I will stop sharing and just to give several examples of uh, how this particular for loop function. For example, we done consultancy for OSC, Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, on how to uh, work in a conflict zone of Donetsk, how to create dialogue across so-called uh, line of contact. And I myself can, uh, create, uh, conducted multiple trainings for representative of OSC, also for Security Council of um, international organization in Ukraine, which includes multiple embassies, USAID, uh, GSS, and so on. Um, I worked also with um, uh, another uh, important work is to increase capacity of universities to, uh, to help educational system in Ukraine. And it was a big project supported by uh, German, Germany on how to in, engage history teachers in this entire Eastern Ukraine into uh, promoting um, 
ideas of peace, uh, promoting ideas of uh, positive peace, not just negative peace, how to engage with local communities, how to address uh, issues related with ongoing war and so on, because a lot of history teachers were not ready to address a lot of problems in um, um, which arise in classrooms related to Crimea, related to Donetsk, how to prepare, how to make history teachers active agents of change. Uh, and universities were very important, Pedag pedagogical universities were very important part of this uh, process. And another two projects which I want to highlight exactly will show how we can help universities to become centers of community. One project which is now on pause, but we really hope and the State Department agreed that we will pick up as soon as we're ready to pick up the situation is um, a bill, it's education of students in Kharkiv uh, University to uh, how to work in communities, how to create change, how to address conflict, how to work with stakeholders, how to uh, bring uh, change in small communities, which particular um, administration work with, for example, small regional, but also work with NGOs and prepare the students, give them all this knowledge and send them for internships for three, four months in uh, during the entire semester in this organization. So they not only will get employment for the future, which start happening, but also they address a lot of needs of these organizations and it was unbelievable to see them we had this round table with multiple organizations which were invited to Kharkiv um, which was few kilometers basically from the uh, occupied territories at this time and uh, and we had like even Red Cross, uh, we had multiple other organizations there and they all told we want the students today, today. And our round table was just, okay, how we can address needs, what we can do. So, but they were ready, they were ready and they wanted students as soon as possible. So this is, could be a way how we as universities working with our Ukrainian colleagues can prepare the new full generation of people who are ready and go immediately into these administrations, into these NGOs, in um, economic uh, organizations, which know how to deal with multi-stakeholder issues, how to deal with conflict dynamics, how to address communities and all of this. So this is just a few examples. I don't want to take more uh, time from a discussion which arises from this. But uh, we have already have capacity and already have strong uh, relationship with multiple universities across uh, Ukraine to build on it and create uh, really opportunities for universities to be engaged in this uh, systemic um, recovering of Ukraine, reconstruction of Ukraine. Thank you, Makarita. Uh, thank you, Karina. Really uh, impressive work, and I think very important to uh, uh, and it's very important to sustain it. And I want to, uh, with the power of being the moderator, I would like to take couple, only a couple minutes to kind of uh, add to what you have said, uh, or especially to emphasize the the participation of locals uh, and locally driven uh, process of this reconstruction. I think one thing that I want to share that this particular approach that Tapri and uh, Carter School are, de uh, are developing is the participatory development of uh, peacemaking and a reconstruction agenda in, uh, in Ukraine with the uh, with uh, together with uh, partners from higher education. I think uh, as uh, I mean, practitioners um, would tell you that peacemaking and reconstruction and like working towards peace is all is always about learning. It is learning not only the issue but also learning what the future will look like and envisioning what the sh and co-creating of, of this shared future. And I think this is. As Dean said in his opening remarks for this this session, uh, far too often we see how reconstruction efforts are sometimes are doing uh, much more harm than good. And I think here what we are trying to emphasize and we're trying to change is the vector of learning, as Karina, you also mentioned. Uh, 
very often there is the vector of learning that comes from international community is that we we meaning collectively hold the knowledge and we are educating or bringing that knowledge to the locals and trying to uh, f force them or encourage them to use the methods, the approaches that we have uh, 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 in the West or wherever the, our localities are without understanding that there is a lot of uh, local capacity, local knowledge and local ways of doing that we are in the West or outside of this community can also learn and improve our practices, improve our approaches. And I think this type of program that we're trying to design and implement precisely emphasizes more symmetric learning process where not only our partners in, in, in Ukraine can benefit from understanding how a higher education can be organized to benefit the reconstruction, but also we can learn and understand what are some local uh, uh, know-hows and knowledge that we can also adapt to deal with our own conflicts in our communities. Uh, like it's no secret that we have issues here in the United States also, and then how we can learn to 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 uh, implement implement those. And I think that the, the the power of this type of approaches is again creating a symmetry of learning and creating uh, a, a a space where, as Marco mentioned, there is this decolonizing process of providing platform and meaningful platform from local uh, for local participation and locally driven and initiated uh, processes. So um, I think. I think that's that's the uh, very uh, strong and important aspect of this uh, uh, engagement. Uh, Margarita, if I may, um, I just really want to say a very interesting fact, um, which reflects have a lot of reflection. Uh, everyone knows there is an upcoming ISA conference, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I was really interested to do like additional research, how many papers will be on Ukraine, about Ukraine and so on. And to my surprise, really localized, specific on Ukraine, specifically dynamics in Ukraine. There is only one session, war in Ukraine. A lot of other papers are about how war in Ukraine impacts something else. And this is very important because really deep, a lot of people have opinions about Ukraine, but really deep knowledge about Ukraine, really research done on Ukrainian dynamics, it's very rare. Uh, so that's why I think our collaboration, having all this participants from Ukraine, people who have a deep years knowledge of working in Ukraine is very important. It's just a very interesting detail which uh, I appreciate you you uh, sharing this reflection. There's uh, one last point that I wanted to uh, to make uh, before uh, opening the floor for questions from the audience and answering some of the questions that already have been posed in the chat is that how we can also through this engagement make uh, elevate the local expertise to be global expertise. Uh, for Ukrainians to become experts, uh, to be not to become, to be seen and and accepted as experts who can provide and consult on other conflicts uh, in in uh, in a immediate geopolitical kind of sphere. Let's say if we're talking about post-Soviet space, but also globally. How, for example, someone from Ukraine with a knowledge of how to uh, experience and knowledge how to deal with a community conflict, let's say in the Lugansk and Donba, uh, uh, Donbas area, can help uh, some a peacemaker, a peacemaker and a community leader, let's say in Colombia, to deal with some of the issues that they're facing. I think this is the biggest missing part in the peace building and uh, peacemaking community today that we can have a real impact uh, uh, elevating and like uh, filling filling that gap. So I'm very enthusiastic about this project. And again, like I would welcome the uh, reflection from the audience uh, about uh, about this. And I want to before um, uh, asking um, to, to pose any questions, um, um, I think this question would be probably to uh, Vadim, uh, based on your uh, experience, but also to Karina, about how much uh, has the number of foreign students and exchange students dropped since the start of the war? And if we know how many students from Russia studied in Ukrainian universities prior to the war and uh, what's what's the situation um, now? And probably vice versa, how many students cause, uh, from, from Ukraine were studying in Russia and what's the situation? Do we know any 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 statistics of that? 
I don't think there are definitely statistics, but I could not take it right now. And, uh, and I don't want to bring like anecdotal evidences, but I didn't see um, a lot of uh, while I was working in Kharkiv, which should be uh, like major region, right? It's completely Russian speaking uh, city. Um, I didn't see exchange of students, at least again, it's based on my observation because we taught multiple students and multiple classes. So, but I don't have any access to statistics. Yes, unfortunately, I don't have the statistics neither in front of me, but uh, I'm, I'm sure, yeah, it's possible to find. Well, the, maybe what can be said in relation to that, uh, what uh, you, Margarita, mentioned that, yeah, there were, of course, students uh, from Ukraine studying in Russia uh, when they were um, started. And uh, not only, I, I know also quite many scholars from Ukraine who were at the moment uh, in Russia. And I know that many of them try to find a way how to leave Russia. Uh, there were also some support organized, like through networks, of course, and uh, some organizations like Helping to Leave, for example, helped uh, quite many uh, scholars uh, of Ukrainian origin uh, who worked in Russia at the time to leave. Yes, but of course, I don't have any concrete numbers and uh, I don't, don't have even those who are at the moment staying there, I don't know. But I think what might be very relevant to it, and it's very important, is that um, during uh, this high hybrid war uh, period from 2014 to the beginning of the war, there were increasing number of university exchange programs between Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine. Oh, this was very important part. And students from both sides, they were like some, some of them were contact type of uh, contact theory type of exchange and they met in particular place or students were going from say Ushgarad to the Parisian, the Parisian to Ternopil. This were, uh, I think, growing number of exchanges within Ukraine, which was very important for Ukrainian uh, national identity, for Ukraine understanding what Ukraine means for people. Thank you. Um, I would like now to invite uh, any members of the audience. If you have questions, you can either unmute yourself to ask your questions or pose your question in the chat. And as we are waiting, I want to kind of um, ask uh, and get us collectively to think about that it's been a year that the war in Ukraine is unfolding. And um, unfortunately, uh, we don't see any significant signs that it's going to end any time. Um, soon, let's say next month, next week, or um, but at the same time, things are keep ha things keep happening in the world uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, earthquake in in Turkey, and then other global crises may arise. So, I, my question would be, how we can collectively um, think about how to keep engagement going when there is this um, international. I would say a uh, short attention span once things some other urgent things happen um, elsewhere, the international attention is shifting. We've seen that happen in, in Syria. Uh, we can, uh, I mean, unfortunately that might happen uh, for in, in Ukraine. Uh, what, what would be our capacity in the, ac the field of academia to, to keep the spotlight, to keep working and uh, sustaining the international engagement uh, in, in, in on the conflict in Ukraine. Yes, Marco. Yeah, I could start. It's a, it, it's a good question uh, uh, and difficult question. Uh, we may end it on a situation of think about the kind of uh, prospect of the war, what will happen. And, and I, I think that one kind of uh, scenario, uh, it, it would be really long continuous war that it, that the kind of intensity of fighting will be will be lower but they will remain on, on, on no kind of situation with no agreement no ceasefire no peace agreement it's kind of a contact line uh, which everyone is waiting when it's been again and escalating and that could in worst case last it for a years to come or decades uh, uh, I, I think actually this is quite uh, uh, most probable also scenario at the moment, and not and and hopefully will be avoided. 
but that's we we are discussing about very long in in worst case very long long period that we have to be discussed and and and, and to be aware that they they are a need to support and need to be engaged i think and then then the thinking about that it's also very different from looking from from different perspectives uh, uh, I'm quite sure that uh, uh, from Finnish, from Finland, as, as I already mentioned, that the, my, my, our neighbors in Baltic states or maybe in Poland, the, they, they remain very constantly following the things in there. It's remained in, 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 in throughout the year that, that's, that uh, it's been very important for, for a lot of Finnish audience, we are feeling. But for another part of Europe, it's already kind of distancing themselves. They are a bit tired of that. They are going on 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 uh, seeing other things and say why it doesn't stop, why it's influencing in in, in my, my kind of costing in, in when I come to shopping, when I kind of getting in a gasoline or, or anything. They don't not everyone is is not not the kind of uh, sharing the same opinions like in and I, I think here in, in in what I call a border states, the the kind of uh, the the general public opinions very anonymous. Uh, that we cannot avoid. I, I think that that, that that is obvious that the that, 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 that people have been tired of that, being the opinions be different. But I think the most important thing is that we be been and discussed and engaged. And not only that, that that there are there are some kind of events where there are few uh audience uh, the only kind of a few people are partisan audiences but engaging on broader kind of uh, discussions in, in media and on the forums is quite important i just talked in, in last week when we were sharing some opinions about the actually the development and, and russian issue and studies in northern america with a colleague in in in, in, in toronto and, and and so what was has to bother me is that that there's so many kind of Ukrainian scholars in, in now in North and, uh, and America and in, in US and Canada, but and a lot of uh, events are, are kind of uh, organized, but there are very few people who are usually participating in these. So it, it have to be so that that's supported that that it, it's kind of also academic voice is, is an Ukrainian voice is heard it beyond on, on very, very kind of a narrow kind of audiences where they where they are and 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 and, and I don't know how but it, it, it is it is important and go further on I think it's it's also important that the we are engaging in 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 also as a peace research community uh, uh, on broader global discussion because this war has been divided the opinions in, in and it's been quite uh, consciously used also I know uh, that from from uh, from Russian perspective also to generating this is as, as a kind of a war against the West and and, and that they the bring Russia as, as a symbol of post-colonial kind of uh, the war and, and and this is the message which has been taking uh, within certain audiences in global South in in, in Africa and Latin America as, as, as a kind of a acceptable because it's supporting their way of thinking about the the, the west so it, it, it's there so far and i think that it, it's a kind of a, uh, also discussion that we as academics need to be engaged in a constructive way and, and and not 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 just to, to make it visible that that that's this this kind of a discussion about the colonialism colonial rules colonial ties are very com complex and complicated and 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 then this perhaps support also to bring this is in the mind of the people and understand it better that how much is also contesting the existing structures of multilateralism and 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 and, and capability of of, of peace building in general not only in, in Europe but in more also globally. Thank you, Marco. Um, anyone? Yes, Vadim. I think you want to add. Uh, yeah, just to address this question regarding, um, um, yeah, what uh, in case of how this attention of international so-called international community is shifting from one to another conflict, uh, and how to actually preclude these shifts uh, because it, these shifts usually happening at the expense of lives of people. And um, I think what is important is simply to think to to reconstruct, rebuild this idea of 
uh, universal humanism, right? That uh, would follow the idea that uh, human sufferings cannot be placed uh, on any scale of hierarchies. Uh, and um, um, and then maybe exactly what Marco mentioned is kind of getting rid of, of the idea of proximity because proximity, especially geographic proximity exactly pre uh, like precludes us of thinking about universality of human sufferings on this globe, especially when we speak about human caused violence. Of course, there are issues of uh, like natural disasters, but human caused violence, uh, and uh, like especially when we speak about the war, the war as such is totalistic by its nature. Whatever it happens, and of different scale, of just you know, few communities, two communities are engaged in armed conflict. For these communities, this war is totalistic. Whenever, wherever they are located. Uh, and uh, this kind of uh, mentality, uh, I think, should be somehow adopted uh, by, by the so-called international community uh, and including, first of all, maybe peace research community. Thank you, Vadim. Um, moving to another question that was posed in the chat, um, a participant is asking with um, agreeing with the idea that there is a need to elevate the local voices and local Ukrainian expertise to become global uh, if uh, that elevation would come only if Ukraine were to be uh, were to become a NATO member or we can see this um, or it can happen in the absence of um, anyone who wants to um, answer that question yeah, yeah I can take this question so um, at least I can start and some people can <coughs> jump so no it doesn't have ukraine doesn't have to be nato and we know clearly that it was the process of this nato enlargement which one was used by russia as justification again it's not justifying russian but it was used i think what is much more important is that ukraine twice showed to entire world that it want to be democratic country through orange revolution through maidan people died for democratic development in ukraine but unfortunately it was not recognized clearly by um or profoundly by european union this vision of ukraine democracy it uh, was a wild east of democracy where everything plays and ukraine was left as the this marginalized zone where russian influence was important um european uk influence was important but in uh, in the middle nothing was really promoting it and the process of finally there is a decision to start in incorporating uh, ukraine into european union but it's a very, very long process. And we know that Turkey, for example, going through this process for decades, because this process allow if one country will put a vet on one of the negotiated articles, this is it, right? So the, the process is uh, stalled. And in uh, this situation, I think the recognition by European Union, the importance of giving voice to Ukraine, giving opportunities for Ukraine to be incorporated and uh, deeply uh, influence the European dynamics and politics. This is where it lay also, um, also your, uh, Ukraine is a part of European Parliament, right? So this is what in, another way where um, Ukrainian voice can be elevated and presented. But again, I think if we look at it, if we look into what happened in Georgia, uh, what happened uh, in first in Moldova, then Georgia, right? And uh, then in Ukraine, uh, with occupied territories by Russia uh, multiplies, uh, and long, as Marco told us, long-term conflict can exist and persist for years, right? Uh, so you can see that uh, this, this is, will help Ukraine to really stand for itself, but also be recognized. So, but it doesn't have to be made. So it's probably a longer uh, answer, but it's very, very important for the whole world to recognize there are other ways to give voice to Ukraine. 
I could continue because I think that yeah, NATO issues is also important also for the Finland. We we have been waiting for the acceptance from yeah, now from Turkey and and and, and Hungary and and how I'm seeing that and and and, and first a couple of the, if there will be some kind of a uh, peace agreement or ceasefire achieved in Ukraine, it certainly would need it very exceptional guarantees. So it it would it would be different than than many and and kind of peace agreements in 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 civil society or or, or small between two small countries. Uh, 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 so it's the only way it could be uh, sustainable. It needed really heavy strong guarantees for someone. And then there's the question: what this could be? I have not found a real a, a solution. Maybe it's it's a native, but it, it's it's a, 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 a seed of of, of, our, of our next conflict. So only in case, especially if the somehow the Russian regime doesn't really change them, which is not expected. So, but still being kind of a agreement to be achieved, and that comes from the the, the, the importance uh, uh, of military alliances uh, on 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 these times. And I think that we, we are not kind of the escape on that 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 kind of realities and how it happens in, in also in, in Finland. If you lost the trust that there are kind of a trust on peaceful future, if you uh, if you start uh, uh, seeing that that the war is, is a possible tool of a politics, it, it's not something that belongs to the past or something that 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 build and and and, and you see that they are. Uh, power for seeing the the use of war is, is a legitimate too. Then people are looking this kind of a peace and security for militarized kind of a way, and it's understandable. It cannot be explained away. So it, it, it's it, it's long process so is to return on 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 back on the trust. Maybe a years or decades long way. Again, you don't need to think about and in, in generally we can talk about and think about cannot change the mind of people it's, it's in that way understandable uh the saying that i, I don't believe that the, that that the, the the membership will be solution but probably it may have some role in, in current P. i would see but that would be highly from my perspective illusion a kind of idealistic and will be not not anywhere realistic the quick uh extension of a EU membership to Ukraine would be much more efficient and I'm just without nothing about all, all criteria, just accepting this will be peaceful expansion, peaceful integration and showing this, this is but because from back in what I was talking about this kind of a probably a quite colonial way of thinking from Western European perspective of things this will be not not taking place but if I would have all power in the world, I would take this step, but I don't. Um, and I very quickly want to kind of put my two cents uh, in this bucket and say that I also don't believe that um, NATO membership is a precondition for elevating these voices. And I think they're um, put it, we, we need to differentiate between the political processes and also the processes of uh, knowledge creation and academic development and ec like developing of the expert field and conditioning uh expertise with the nato membership has a larger implication for other countries in the world which means that let's say someone from um uh rwanda their expertise will never be elevated because they will not be um or like the prospects of them becoming a nato member are like non-existent or very slim at the moment so again i think there we should there in in the academic community in the expert community peace building community we should think about how separate this processes and run them in a par parallel constructive synergy uh with the process of democratization, but also elevating the the, the, the local voices. Um, yeah, so that, that those were kind of my two two cents uh, here. Um, any other questions from from the um, audience? Margarita, if I may, while we're still <laughs> waiting, I think this would be very important also to think and ask collectively as international society, why in the vote yesterday, 
uh, we saw that uh, 32 countries abstain from the resolution. What was the reason for that? And while we know there is a, a violation of human rights, as we saw today from the uh, presentation, which highlighted even like this, what they working with ICC, we know that it was unjustified uh, in, uh, in, um, intervention and uh, an invasion in a country. Why still 32 countries are abstaining? And I think this is, if we answer this question very, very well and how we can deal with it, I think it will be also because this is the answer for uh, the dynamics. Why still there is the abstain and there is why still support for what Russia is doing. Unfortunately, and I, that brings me to um, a question, a very controversial, probably, and I would like to pose both to the audience and to 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 uh, you and my colleagues. Uh, we spoke about, I mean, resonates with a lot of what we have been talking about with the support to to Ukraine higher education system to overcome, to rebuild, to build resilience. Um, and I know now it is not the time in Ukrainian society is not ready to talk about reconciliation and like cross border initiatives. But do you think we need to start thinking like in the long run, how to work also with the Russian education system and higher education to change the narratives? Because as we as we heard our esteemed colleague said in the in the uh, first session that she believes that for the next two generations, there is really no in, in her words, like there is no hope for engaging with 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 the uh, with uh, Russians in general because of the propaganda. However, if there is no change in the education system. There is no change in narratives and how history will be written and taught in Russia uh, from today and for, for the next decade will condition the future of this relationship. So do we see a place for us in an uh, academic world to help shaping more inclusive narratives uh, on both sides? Well, I would like to see us of all that. Uh, the situation has a, a, it's very difficult also for me on, on, on thinking how how it's possible and and, and 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 I think that this this conflict this war has been much closer to me than any other we have been been following and and, and it connected with the perhaps with with, the, with our kind of also national narratives and, and it's really really kind of a push me in and on, on, on edge to, to, to think about on an inclusive way of, and then easily to follow up back and on, 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 on stereotypic way of thinking. Uh, the question is, is, is just which I don't know. I needed, I, I know what is needed. We needed a kind of a, to reconcile. We needed a kind of a connect the people, but we needed also the chains of, about the, 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 well, I return back another word which I used to decolonizing the collective memories, decolonized way of thinking about the, what, what you are and, and open up. Uh, uh, but I may end it up at the same solution that it takes a couple of generations. But maybe, but if you are more optimistic that, that you see that there are changes coming. But that doesn't mean that we should not think about and push it and, 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 and believe it that it will take place in one, that it's a directions in some day. Margaret, if I, I may, I want to share one data which um, uh, which can help probably to understand what's going on. This is the uh, research from Levada Center on the support for uh, war in Ukraine, but uh, in Russia. And this is a very, very telling. If you see here that nothing changed, Despite what was going in, uh, like all this uh, setbacks, uh, lost, it's basically very, 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 very similar. And why is it? It's because people in Ukraine, in Russia, does not really do not really receive any real information. They live in this uh, bubble of uh, pr uh, propaganda. They receive only like even like the idea was that so at least 
200,000 uh, soldiers killed in Ukraine. It should impact society somehow. It's a big, no, there is no impact. Why? Because it's not reality they live in there. What they react in it is a propaganda, is this machine which is working there. And I do believe is the more we will try to purge this bubble, the more we will try to alter this propaganda machine from multiple ways. The, uh, this is the way how we can pursue it. Because this is an unbelievable data which show us how propaganda works in Russia. Yes, I mean, unfortunately, that that's true. I mean, um, par media is powerful uh, and um, not having access to alternative sources of information and believing what is um, being they are being told constantly um, is obviously shaping the way that they're thinking. That's what I'm saying. I think it's it's that can sift through to new textbooks, history textbooks, and other like social science te textbooks that can shape not only the current environment, but also uh, generations to come with no prospect of real, real peace. But I would be more optimistic here. I return you back to it and then as soon as there is a possibility to purge this bu bubble, I live through the, um, all of Soviet Union, and it was unexpected to everyone. Nobody really saw it almost coming, right? So there were a lot of processes, but nobody believed it will, well, like it did. And I think there is a lot of posit positive, optimistic view that by if you try multiple times, if you do it systemically, it, change will come. So it's just a uh, some, some optimistic view for in the, this very, very sad day. I think it's a good to end it in an optimistic way. And I think that perhaps we can learn. I think uh, uh, we should perhaps uh, as a research community and, and, and an peace researcher in general talk about more and, and how I trust uh, on, on this authoritarian uh, uh, challenge or problem. And, and, and uh, uh, I think it, quite nicely referred to the, to, the, to the times in Cold War in the Soviet Union. So uh, uh, how in constructive and inclusive way uh, uh, to support the civil society in, 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 in totalitarian and authoritarian and, and, and regimes, not only in Russia, without not be a counterproductive. So how to, en to kind of empower uh, 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 this kind of a immersive inclusive society it's not easy you easily come and, and, and perhaps that it, it's an issue that should be discussed in peace building community more broadly perhaps it's not and, and a sharing experiences not only about that in in, in these cases there this issue about the sharing experiences how on the support on, on, on this kind of cases of civil society where civil society activities is it, it kind of a becoming uh, uh, illegalized and and, 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 and and it's not the safe to express your opinions uh, uh, and, 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 and cooperation with the uh, foreign uh, uh, civil society or actors is, is, is also criminalized. So there is, is a kind of a, a kind of experiences to be shared. And also at the moment, there are kind of a lot of organizations working in different parts, in different kind of authoritarians and trying to work in, in, in these. I've been just following about the certain Finnish organization, how they are managed to work, for example, within the Myanmar and, and, and supporting on them. And, and, and perhaps some also historical experiences, because I think that that's safer, but kind of a, uh, uh, way of, 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 of in kind of intervening on in Russian opinions would be counterproductive. It, it, it's supporting existing narratives on, on there and and, 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 and and this is what we should discuss and, and, and I think that that's created a discussion on, on these this. Thank you very much. I thank everyone for this engaging discussion and uh, presentations. I really, um, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, I thank uh, Dean Ozerdem and Marco for uh, coming up with this uh, idea and engaging us in this uh, in, in in this process. And I really hope that the pr the project will 
gain the momentum and we will be actually collectively be able to uh, have positive impact in the process of reconstruction of Ukraine in helping uh, Ukrainians to uh, work through their traumas, work through uh, this devastation of war and build a more uh, resilient and secure society for themselves and also for I mean, for, for a larger world community, because again, like war in one place has this crippling uh, effect on, on everywhere, uh, everywhere, especially at this uh, at this scale. Um, I thank our audience for joining us and I encourage you to stay on. We'll stay, uh, we will take a 30 minute break, but then we have another two very engaging sessions. And I really uh, hope that you can stay with us and uh, uh, hear uh, other uh, great speakers that we have lined up for you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, and yes, we'll see everyone in 30 minutes.